capable of regulation, both in the way that dogs and cats are. If you want to train your cat not to go on the couch, saying, please don't go on the couch, you'll leave fur there, and my aunt is allergic, is in fact not an effective way to train your cat not to go on the couch. To train your cat not to go on the couch, you need to do something like put a crinkly piece of paper there that makes an ugly noise every time she sits down. Or perhaps spray her gently with a water bottle whenever she goes on the couch. In so doing, you set up associations between being on the couch and a negative outcome, and you change her associations with it. But you don't do it in a way that engages reflective self-regulation. We as human beings, with both old brain and new, can regulate ourselves in the way that we regulate and train animals through associating certain activities with positive things and other activities with negative ones. But we can also do so making use of a kind of reflection and self-regulation that involves a certain kind of self-control. And we'll talk about that more in later lectures. So what I want to do now, having given you first some literary texts in which we have articulated the idea of the soul being divided, and then quickly run through the various divisions that we read about today, is to, oh sorry, there's a fourth example from Jonathan Haidt. What I want to do really is to tell you about controlled and automatic processing and then do what I said I would just do. So some of you at the conclusion of this class are going to walk from this room, perhaps by taking an elevator, over to a lecture in another part of WLH that is taught by John Barge. And what I want to describe for you here is a study that John Barge did roughly 15 years ago that brings out the relation between controlled and automatic processing. So Barge brought subjects into his laboratory and had them engage in what's called a scrambled sentence task. A scrambled sentence task is a task where you're given a list of words, say five words, he, beautiful, doorway, relevant, Thursday, and you're asked to put four of them into a sentence. In so doing, you're forced to engage with the meanings of the words. The only idea of the scrambled sentence task is to get you thinking about various words. So subjects in this study were presented either with a set of words that were just a wide range of words, or with a set of words, a portion of which had terms typically associated with the elderly. Words like wrinkly and bingo and Florida. <laughs> Those subjects who unscrambled the sentences that had words associated with the elderly presumably had primed in their mind the idea of old person. And then the dependent variable, dv, which Barge measured, was how long it took the people when they left the study to walk to the elevator. So subjects who had engaged in the typical scrambled sentence task walked quite quickly to the elevator. But those who had been given words associated with the elderly went very slowly. Indeed, subjects who were in the ordinary condition took just over seven seconds to get to the elevator, whereas subjects who had been primed with words associated with the elderly took more than a second and a half longer to get there. Now, Presumably, this was not because they were consciously thinking, oh, I got to get to my bingo game. <laughs> it was because an image of something had been evoked in their mind unconsciously beneath the level of awareness, and it ended up affecting their behavior. 
And in a series of studies that Barge went on to do over the next few years and which he continues to do now, he found this effect over and over again. So for example, some subjects were primed with terms that had to do with politeness, others with terms that had to do with rudeness, and the dependent variable, the thing which he was measuring, was how likely they were to interrupt the experimenter when they needed to get information from the experimenter. Those primed with words associated with politeness waited almost 15 minutes, whereas those primed with words associated with rudeness went up right away and interrupted the experimenter. More recently, in the domain of embodied cognition, he's been looking at things like what happens if you hold a warm or a cold coffee cup before you evaluate a resume. And subjects who have, in the elevator, helped the experimenter by, could you just hold my mug, please, holding a warm mug, as opposed to, could you just hold my mug, please, holding a cold mug, were more likely to evaluate the resume positively. That is, a sense of warmth in one domain brings with it a sense of warmth in the other. 